Sure, butter tarts, poutine, and Nanaimo bars might be identifiable Canadian delicacies, but what of our maple syrup? Bountiful Ontario blueberries or famous PEI potatoes. Items grown here and known worldwide. Items as tied to our appetites as they are to our identities. Joining us now for more on that, Diane Pecon, sociologist at the University of Ottawa. Sarah Elton, journalist and author of Consumed, Food for a Finite Planet. And Mark Holmes, professor and coordinator at the Centre for Hospitality and Culinary Arts Chef School at George Brown College. And it's good to have you three here at TVO. And if I may say, enchanté, madame. Usually we talk to you on the line from Ottawa. It's so good to have you here. My pleasure. So let me start with you right away. Is it important to talk about food? Absolutely, Pourquoi? because food is one of the major um, dimensions of our reality as uh, biological and sociological beings. We're constantly, you know, discussing food because it's a, we, we, we discuss about our identity while we're discussing about food. And in today's society, uh, the discourse on food is uh, a different type of discourse because before it was mostly related to religious reasons. There was a very big link between uh, religious discourses and food. Today, it's uh, the consumer ideology which is really uh, leading our discourse on food. The consumer ideology. Yes, definitely. That... I believe we are defined by, uh, by consumerism. And we consume food in a way which is quite different than all the different historical moments before us. So we are also in a moment of history which we are very um, worried about food, which doesn't make sense in many ways because we are not in a moment of history where there is a lack of food on the opposite. There is huge amounts of food available all the time to all of us. But there is a, a preoccupation with food which is uh, related to the crisis that we are going mm -hmm. through, individual and collective crisis. Well, let me pick up on that with Sarah. Uh, in, you know, we talk about PEI potatoes. I mean, if you say to lots of people in Canada, PEI, that's how they will fill in the blank. Talk to us about the significance of food and place, that relationship. Well, food connects us to a place. So for most of human history, our food, our cuisine has been about where we live, uh, about the geography, the climate, and, and our food culture has arisen out of these factors. But oh, I guess over the last 50 plus years, we've seen this massive shift towards this consumerism. And I don't know, would people asso associate PI potatoes, um, PI with potatoes anymore? You go to the supermarket and you get potatoes from all sorts of, well, a lot from the United States, as well as from Ontario, from PEI, we are, we've lost this connection to place. And, uh, and, and that's happened in my lifetime. Uh, what, when I was a child, there were more seasons than there are now. Um, you, you'd have to wait for your strawberries until they were in season. You'd have to wait till your sweet corn came in August. Now you can go to the supermarket and you can get sweet corn just about any time of the year. Hmm. Well, Big shift. Can, uh, Mark, we make any general statements about what Canadians eat? Well, Canadians eat a lot of different foods, and so trying to even narrow down a Canadian diet has become uh, a huge issue, uh, and one that's been talked about a lot in literature. Uh, authors such as uh, Hirsch Jacobs uh, was trying to define a Canadian cuisine, and he actually came to the conclusion that you know we can look at common foods, but with the fact that Canadians, Canada is becoming more of an international area for food, we see all different international dishes. So narrowing down Canada to one food, one dish, um, one set ideal for food is no longer possible. Can you come to the conclusion that a lot of what we eat is junk? Would you say that? <laughs> I would say a lot of what we eat is junk. Lots of fat and sugar and processed foods, mm -hmm. uh, in part because those cost less than fresh, wholesome, lean meats, uh, um, lower calorie, higher content, nutritious foods. Um, so you know, that all impacts what we eat here in Canada. Is the average, uh, Sarah, the average Canadian's diet, quote unquote, environmentally friendly? No, uh, no. And we, we are eating a lot of these processed foods. We are eating food that, well, if we think about it, it causes a lot of, uh, well, has a huge 
imp 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 implications for climate change, specifically meat-rich diets. That the, the environmental costs of a meat-rich diet are, are high. But it's not just, it's not just uh, meats. We generally are not thinking of sustainability when we go to the supermarket. Or, and, and my concern is to try to figure out, well, what makes for a sustainable diet? And, and that comes a lot back to agriculture. But you know, when I ask that question, I don't mean what the food is doing to our body. I mean what it's doing to our environment. Mm -hmm. And, we, and uh, you maintain we are not eating an environmentally sensible diet as well? No, correct. We are not eating an environmentally sensible diet. We, we, sh we ideally, we should be. And, and what I write about are the food movements around the world that are creating more sustainable food systems. But what, what would be a better for our environment if we bought our food f from farms where the farmers are, are caring for their nutrients so there isn't uh, fertilizer runoff, they're making sure that they have a pollinator habitat, the animals are, that they do raise are treated uh, ethically, and their manure is incorporated into the farm. It's, I mean, it sounds very, very ideal, and yet it is possible, and it is happening. It is just not the mainstream. Let me follow up with Deanne on this. We know that your students probably aren't following partisan politics as carefully as you would like them to, or as much of the, you know, maybe as their parents would like them to. Having said that, do they care about food politics more Some than they do polit partisan politics? Some of them. I, I believe that um, a large percentage of militantism now, especially, specifically with young people, is uh, to fight causes which are very close to themselves. And uh, they do, uh, they have developed strategies in order to counteract this extremely pathological rapport that we have with food right now, which is, as I said, cons the consumer mm -hmm. society. We, we eat according to trends. We don't, we, don't, we don't eat things that we need to eat. It's like we're supposed to eat. Okay, so what's so the, the politics students, around food that the they students like? students that are resisting, you know, consumerism, they do, uh, they, they have boycotted, you know, places that they consider that they are ideologically unacceptable. Mm. Like I have seen so, some, some of my students picketing in front of Starbucks which otherwise I frequent, you know, religiously in many ways. Well, why are but they picketing in front of Starbucks? Because for them, it doesn't correspond to the ethical, you know, uh, production of coffee, and it is expensive, and it is, you know, part of the capitalist, you know, establishment. And also they have all those practices which are very interesting, like recycling products, which have been thrown away. There's this movement called dumpster diving, which literally they go and uh, recover food that has been, you know, uh, rejected by the system, and mm. they do prepare food for the for for uh, homeless people, even who, for students at the university who do not do not have the means to pay breakfast and so on and so forth. So there is this uh, very interesting and in many ways paradoxical, you know, new uh, body politics, which the students they say we have to protect our bad body from consumer society and therefore we have to counteract the system which is, which is, which is based on waste, you know, like we're always wasting things. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's get back, you know, to a wholesome way of, of relating to food. But it remains quite marginal, but I believe that it's very significant when it comes to, you know, today's militantism. Mark, let me follow up with you. How, in terms of the general population, how aware, how much do the general public care about the kind of food politics that Deanne just described? Some of the population care. Um, if you look at farmers markets, they're starting to pop up more and more around the, the country, in part because there's a demand for them. Uh, when you talk to farmers market patrons and you ask them, why are you coming here? Uh, the responses are health. They want a healthier diet. They're, they want to know where their food comes from. And they want to meet the farmer, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. Uh, they want to get that interaction, find out who they are, uh, why are they doing this, how do they process their food, how do they care about their food, because people are becoming more weary of what they're eating. People are becoming more weary of what they put in their bodies. So that's a diet thing as opposed to a political thing, is that right? That's a diet thing more than a political thing, but I think you, it's, um, you pay with your dollar. So when you walk in the grocery store, you have a choice of going something that's local or organic versus something where it just says made in the USA. Let me follow up on that. The, the, you know, local, organic, we hear all these kinds mm -hmm. of terms which we're told are better for us uh, both politically and in terms of our own health. Is it true? Is it really true? It can be, um, and I'll, uh, I'll bring in my other fellow colleagues here. Uh, but in my opinion, I mean, local food's going to taste better because it's coming to your door faster. 
So you're not, it's not going to be processed, it's not going to be blanched with chemicals, shipped across a border, or flown in on a plane, and you're eating it two weeks after it's been picked. A local product can be picked, and then the next day you could have it on your table. And so there's more, there's more taste to it, uh, and in many cases, more nutrition to it. But that being said, it also depends on whether you, they're using uh, conventional farming methods where they're using more pesticides and, and uh, more conventional means to produce the food or if they're using more sustainable methods of production. See, that's the thing, Sarah. Like, you, you see local, you see organic, and you wonder, are these marketing labels or is this really different? Well, what we need is a system where, and, and, and in some ways organic standards are doing this now in Canada, um, we need standards so the consumer can understand what they're getting. Um, but it's, it is better for our health also in another way, and that is when we have farms that we buy food from um, they, that are nearby, they can stay in business, and then we're protecting all that farmland near our cities, and that farmland offers us not only healthy food, but it offers us what they call you know, ecological goods and services. So we benefit in many ways, plus it's good for our local economy. Food dollars, they move around, and they, they create jobs, and they, they, they create all sorts of well, opportunity for innovation. And when we're thinking food, I mean, that's why I love to write about food, is because food is not just about what's on the plate, but it's about politics, about, it's about economics, it's about food culture. It all comes together. And the opportunity for creating a wonderful alternative food system is very rich. And that's why there is this global social movement of people around the world that we don't hear much about who are working towards the same goals that people are here in Ontario. Hmm. In which case, Deanne, how would you get people to change their food behavior for ethical reasons? It's very complicated because it's the whole society that has to change. Like, as I said, our rapport with food used to be sacred. There was a, there was a symbolic order. Like, we didn't eat just anything any day, any time of the day. Like, now I know people who eat breakfast three times a day, and other ones, you know, who eat turkey uh, outside of Thanksgiving. So there is a rapport with food, which is because of consumers, has uh, this, before food was something between necessity and pleasure. Mm. Now it's strictly pleasure. It's about pleasure. It's, and also, let us not forget, we live in a very individualistic society. So people want to be satisfied, they want to be, you know, satiated. And, and this is another aspect which is very complicated. Like, we never had so many food, but we're always hungry. <laughs> you know, and it's problematic, in, and I believe deeply that it comes from this uh, disassociation that happened at a certain time between a, a code that codified, you know, what you eat on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Christmas, you know, and so on and so forth, and the fasting that was related to religion also. People mm. knew there were moments of the year that you stopped eating. Now there is such a big symbolic confusion that people, they don't know how to resist to this unending seduction that comes from commercialism, that comes from, as I said, you know, like the, the big corporations, you know, they're always after us if you don't eat this. And, you know, so food, food became a trend, like fashion. So mm. it's very complex. Mark, what appeal would you make to people to try to get them to change uh, their eating habits, uh, the, the way they respect the environment around them, all of that kind of thing. What's the appeal? I think, uh, take a cooking course. Uh, we've lost the ability to cook, and a lot of people nowadays rely on fast food. 60% of people will eat out at least once a week. So we're starting to rely more on processed foods, prepackaged foods. Microwave uh, ovens. Microwave ovens. And I think if we can get back to people learning how to trust a chicken, people learning how to, you know, just chop up a few Sorry, veg. what did you say? Learning trust how to... Trust a chicken. Trust a chicken? Trust a chicken. That's can right. I admit something awful? I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> what does to, that mean? To trust a chicken means to, to tie the chicken back, try the legs, tie the wings, so it's not going to burn when you put it in the oven. Okay, I, that's, that's a new one on me. So, I mean, if people Talking can... about a guy who eats at McDonald's three times a week, but anyway, okay, I gotta learn well, well, here. There, there are some healthy options. I mean, fast food has come in some ways to offer more healthy options. You don't just walk in and, you know, burger and fries, you have options for your sides, baked potato, side salad. So, I mean, there is some movement, but I think that if people can learn to cook for themselves, they'll actually understand what's going into their food. Hmm. Do you think Canadians are open to eating differently going forward? It, there's been such a radical shift in the last 10 years. It, it astounds me, and this is this is what I live and breathe every day. The the number of people who are thinking about sustainability, who are who are going to farmers markets, who are who are thinking about where their food comes from, is is just 
enormous. And why is this happening? Well, why is this happening? I think we have this large anxiety about our food because our, our food is scary. The, the industrial food system, there's a whole bunch of bad stuff that's, being, that's been said about the industrial food system, and a lot of it uh, is, is, is well-founded. Um, and it just doesn't speak to our souls and to our hearts. Like, we want our food to, to, to please us. And we have seen such an incredible response to what's happening by fast food advertising. You go around and you see their fast food companies who are thanking our local farmers for producing food. So, the, and, and the supermarket is being refashioned to feel like a farmer's market. There's obviously major dollars at stake here, and the big food companies are paying attention to what's happening. I hear you, but there presumably must still be a lot of marks in just getting it, get it out there, get it into my body, and let me get out of here within 20 minutes because I got, I got my life to lead. Right? Absolutely, because our food culture is one that does not value cooking from scratch. Mm -hmm. Our food culture does not value anything but convenience and, and cheapness, Precisely. right? So that's going to push us to buy prepared foods and go to the supermarket and buy our pre-made meals. And taste. And taste. And it, is, taste. Yeah, it has to We're be. We're obsessed with that, aren't absolutely, we? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and obviously, when you go in a restaurant and they add all the additives, and you know, it tastes better than the food that we eat at home. You know, but taste. Our taste buds have been have been schooled by now generations exactly. of eating these processed foods. Absolutely. So we're expecting that you know, hit of salt, that fat, that sugar. Wow, we want. When really, if we were cooking from scratch, you don't even have to trust it. You don't even have to know how to trust it. A chicken to easily cook for your family mm -hmm. and feed them food that you went and you bought from a local farmer who is growing it in a sustainable way. It's also a matter of, uh, of, of money. It's very expensive to buy organic food. It's not easy to get to it. So there is a discrepancy, which is like literally a class discrepancy. I see that in, in, the, in, the, in the families where there is more money coming in, uh, this desire of changing our ways, it's more feasible. Mm -hmm. But when you have a family, you know, which has no money, or for instance, you know, my students who they have to eat at the cafeteria yeah, for they're convenience, on a they're on a budget, it becomes, it, it becomes more difficult. So we are in a transitional moment, I think. Right now, I believe the consciousness is there. There aren't that many people who are not aware and have this anxiety about food. We, we really, literally, people think that they are poisoned, you know, they mm -hmm. eat things which are killing themselves. So there is, the consciousness is there. It's, how to succeed in, 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 in changing the practices, you know, concerning, you know, how we eat. And I believe that will take maybe a little bit longer, you were but I'm not to. sure that. Yeah, well, I wanted to say that that is exactly the, the a cost issue, this, this idea that, that sustainable food is more expensive, um, is one reason why the people who are working to build better sustainable food systems are thinking about this. How do we make this food system accessible to everybody? Sure. Everybody has to be invited. So mm -hmm. we're talking, you know, in, make a, a living wage, living minim, a minimum wage that, mm -hmm. that people can live off of. We're talking, how do you, how do you ensure that the farmer makes enough money. Exactly. Farmers are, the, are among the poorest people in the world. Right. So how do we have a food system where farmers are, are, are earning a decent wage as well? So we have to rethink that entire food system. And that's why economics is so important as well. If, though, Mark, we were going to change our diets so that we cared less about fast, get it into me, get out of there, you know, less about the obsession with taste, more about how to cook your own foods, more about how to eat an environmentally sensible diet, would it look a lot different than what we do right now? It would look a lot different in that, I mean, right now you go to a restaurant, and how many times do you walk in, you sit down, you say, I'm gonna have a steak. What size of steak do you order? Because most of the time it's 12 to 16 ounces. Right. You don't eat that much, right? The, the human, average person can eat between 100 and 300 grams of protein at a meal, but you could even get away with only 50. So if you sat down and you got a salad that had three pieces of sliced steak on top of it, would you feel that you got value for your money? And this is part of the know, issue. But, that's, is but, that, I, but I probably but that think that's healthier for me. It is I? healthier for yeah. you. If you start filling your plate with more greens and with more vegetables and with things that have more nutrition for you, you'll have a better, a healthier diet. And if you start cutting down on the protein you're eating, you're actually be cutting some of that protein that we're forcing our farmers to produce hmm. tons of, which is creating the greenhouse gases. Sarah, let's just finish up. I'm going to finish up right there, actually, Mark. It's a nice segue, which is as you look forward, and the impact climate change will have on what we can grow and therefore what we eat, what comes to mind? Oh, 
well, it depends, it depends if I'm feeling optimistic or pessimistic, but I'm going for optimism today. Okay. So I'm envisioning a future where we have uh, a consumer culture, or, or, or rather a food culture that isn't a consumer culture, a food culture that, that values other things, that values the way, the, the ethics of food, the, that values the, the, how the food was raised, how- That's all wrapped up that in climate change? That was all wrapped up, up yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Climate change is very connected to, well, Climate change is, is the push factor. Why do we need to care about this now? Why do every single one of us have to start thinking about how our food is produced and, and choosing food that is better because of climate change? It's our opportunity. Each of us can do something every day to, for climate change. Because agriculture contributes significantly Absolutely. to climate change, as we've just heard earlier in the program. Do you want to take the last word on that? I think that it contributes to climate change. And one of the things that we're trying to do is we're developing the chefs of the future at George Brown. And so we've actually written sustainability into our course lectures. Huh. We've actually built nutrition into the course lectures. So every recipe now has nutrition on it. And they shouldn't label so our students can understand it. And we teach it, we teach them how to replace foods. So instead of having a huge steak on the plate, how can we replace that with some grains or with uh, lentils? Or how can we replace it with something with higher protein content that doesn't necessarily have to be beef all the time? Tell me this, do you have a course called How to Truss a Chicken? Because <laughs> I think I need to sign up for that one. That's a new thing I learned today. Thanks for that. Uh, Diane Pecon, Mark Holmes, Sarah Elton, good of you to join us at TVO for this tonight. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.